Robert Stone. I'm a writer. I've been a teacher as well, but uh, right. what I do is, is right. I, th I think I was still in grade school when uh, I began to understand the degree of pleasure I was taking in, in telling stories and, and in language and in uh, words and the power that I felt they had. Uh, I took to repeating words over and over to myself and making connections with them. And I really liked telling stories and I really enjoyed language and, and what it did and what seemed to be its possibilities. Uh, and when I, was a, when I was a child, I read you know, the, the kind of books that, that children read, uh, uh, it, the series of adventure stories like The Hardy Boys and uh, uh, this, this kind of thing. Uh, and I read, uh, as I got a little older, I read, uh, I read Kipling. I read the, 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 the first uh, moderns. I read, I read Stephen Crane, the Red Badge of Courage. Uh, uh, one of the first modernist uh, novelists that, uh, that I ever read was uh, John Steinbeck. And I, I, I was really moved by Steinbeck and his lyricism and maybe his sentimentalism. But uh, uh, then I discovered Hemingway. I read the, the Sun Also Rises. And I think any writer of my generation was probably uh, electrified or given fits by, by Hemingway. Just the, 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 the sheer pleasure you could take in reading Hemingway, the, the astonishing nature of the discoveries he made about non sequiturs and how words could cast shadows and how you could use the white space. And this was, you know, it was all in, in one rush of, of, of reading. It wasn't an uncommon reading list for the, for the most part. It was, it was everything I blundered uh, into. I read the African adventure stories of Paul du Chaillou, who was a, apparently preposterous self-mythologizer who uh, explored or claimed to have explored Africa in, in the 1860s. Uh, I read Admiral Byrd's uh, accounts of his expeditions, which was kind of, kind of ironical because I was eventually going to be on one of Byrd's uh, expeditions in the one that he, he himself did not uh, conduct because he had died, but uh, all this kind of, you know, uh, stories of romantic adventure. Well, you know, I had been reading these accounts, which were, you know, as I, I, I now realize, were ghost written by some Navy PR man, uh, such as I would sort of be later. And I joined the Navy, and I went to radio school, and uh, uh, I was detached from radio outfit to uh, to go aboard the USS Arneb on, on under the command of an admiral named Dufek, who was following through on uh, on uh, on the Operation Deep Freeze Three of voyages. So I was the I was the I think what they called me was the the senior enlisted journalist on Operation Deep Deep Freeze Three. It gave me the official rate of uh, journalist third class, <laughs> which, I, yeah, you know, which I mean, I was a kid. Uh, I was really quite young, and uh, so I got a I got a huge charge out of out of all this, out of out of going around the world, out of being down in the Antarctic and being 20 years old and being technically a non-com. And I love being at sea, and I always I always have uh, sort of fit in with my reading in a, in a crazy way. I felt, you know, in that, in the years that I was in the Navy, uh, kind of growing up in the, in the Navy, I felt like that somehow I'd, I was doing something that I'd always wanted to do. And I had the odd feeling you get when you're young and you suddenly find yourself 
doing something you think you've always wanted to do? Well, it's, uh, it, it really dictates its own language to, 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 try, to try to describe the infinite contradictions and, and ironies that are generated by language, language that's uh, deliberately perverse or, or often deliberately perverse and simply perverse because of its, of its nature. Uh, the, an attempt, the attempt to link life and language anyway without even getting to you know, uh, uh, a situation as, as, as complex and fraught as war is a strange thing anyway. When you try, you try to hook up language with life, you run into millions of, of, of shadows and, and contradictions and ironies. Uh, I should say that my experience of war in Vietnam was quite limited, uh, but I did feel a necessity to see what I could. I mean, I wasn't in the military at that point. I was freelancing. Uh, but you always learn. I think you learn from the experience of war, and I, mine was not, uh, circumstantially, my experience was not as demanding of me, of my, you know, of my sanity, as it, as it was for many people. But I certainly, I certainly found out things that I hadn't known before. Uh, when I was in the military itself, I really hadn't seen. I'd seen a lot of water. I'd seen a lot of, of, uh, you know, of, the, of the world. I couldn't do much with it, but I, I could see it. Uh, I, I, however, I wasn't involved in any, in any, uh, uh, any action as a sailor, except as a witness uh, to some of the fighting in the Middle East. But in Vietnam, I, had, I, I went to Vietnam with the objective of being a witness. And, uh, you know, this, it, it puts you in a place you haven't been. So, you know, I, I, I learned a lot, I think. You know, to, 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 just to put a lot of experiences together. And, you know, I wasn't there a long time, and I wasn't in the worst places by any means. But uh, there's a phrase in Lear that always took hold of me, and it's where Lear is wandering mad on the heath, and he sees uh, the, the, the character uh, uh, it, it, Edgar, who is pretending to be mad and who is pretending to be a beggar in rags and, and, and in a way is now a beggar in rags in the play. And Lear sees this demented youth who is coming apart at the seams and chanting and prattling and says, Un unaccommodated man is no more than such a poor, bare, forked creature as thou art. And the phrase unaccommodated man always stayed with me, and I always associated it with what I'd seen in, in Vietnam, and then what I'd seen, you know, subsequently in, you know, in the Gaza Strip, in various places, or difficult places that I'd worked. Unaccommodated man, man in the wrong place, any man in the wrong place, any person in the wrong place, unaccommodated, lost, threatened, hungry, dislocated, unaccommodated. And somehow those two words became for me a kind of prayer or chant or invocation or something. So to roll it all, you know, to roll them all together, you know, what I saw, uh, the worst thing I've seen, I think has been the spectacle of unaccommodated man. Well, I think you always miss your youth. I mean, in, in a way, you, you want it back, and that's the time when I was young and my friends were young, and we thought we knew the score. And 
we, in our way, we were very, we were very snobbish in a sense. We really thought we had a lot of things going that nobody in the history of the world had ever had going before. We took ourselves, you know, we had a high opinion of ourselves. And we had enormous fun with the music and with each other and with the drugs. Uh, you know, not everybody was lucky. Uh, it was, you know, it, there, there, there were risks. People did not always uh, survive some of those, some of those ecstasies. But, uh, I, you know, I can't wish myself back there. I, I, I wouldn't wish myself back there. It's an imper as much as I might wish for, you know, youth again. But it's an imperfect world. And it's such a trade-off, what you, what what you have to, to pay, you know, to be young and crazy. You have to not know so much. You have to not understand so many risks. Uh, you have to be so much braver than you're going to be later. It, uh, you know, you're always you're always trading off, you know, one thing against another. I mean. Uh, it, 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 the, the drugs, the world around the drugs was strange and, and very frightening. But there are effects that I had from psychedelics at times that I would never dismiss as illusionary. I mean, there are things, it seems to me, that I saw experienced out there on that kind of psychedelic level that I swear are truths about how things are. But they don't, I can't defend them or even examine them very rationally. I think, uh, I, you know, I, th I think, you know, in one, one thing you, that you learn from, from those drugs, I think, is it, or you acquire a deep suspicion that what we see normally is no more than what we need to see as creatures so many feet off, off the ground. And our, our perception is really functional. And there may be a whole lot more out there than, uh, uh, than we are normally equipped to see. I myself, speaking for myself, I'm not sorry that I ever had those experiences. Well, actually, that's probably not true because there are times when I was you know, so frightened out of my wits that I, I think I would have, I would have traded it all to be, to be out of there. And I couldn't recommend it to anybody because I've seen too many people uh, really swept away and endangered by it. It's, you know, it's, it's something that one can't recommend. I mean, it, to recommend it with one person is, is to really perhaps do that person a great disservice. It's, it's, it's to sort of taking your head in your hands and it may go well and it may not go well. So it's, you know, to suggest to anybody that they, they try it, I, I would have to, I think, feel I really knew them very well and would and be feel comfortable about any outcome and uh, I don't think I could get that comfortable guessing, you know, guessing what would happen to anybody. Yeah. Well, they're states of consciousness. They are all altered states of consciousness. I mean, the the reason language has the effects that it has. I mean, in literature, is because it's. It, it, it's it's recapitulating music. I mean, poetry rhymes, or or is metered so you'll remember it. And so, what's behind the the, the rhythms of poetry are, are these monomic techniques that are pure sound in a way. So it's the this mixture of sound and meaning that is as musical in a way, or certainly as sonic, as it is rational. It's a rational narrative, or maybe an irrational narrative, but it's also something that's going on on a purely sensory, sensual level. So it is an altered state of consciousness. 
And in that sense, certainly a drug, certainly a drug made out of sensibility, made out of, of, uh, of our senses, and uh, that, that, that occupies our space, removes us from our own space, and lets the artist inhabit our space, the way music inhabits your space, or poetry inhabits your space, or, or great prose inhabits your space in a good cause. It, it alters your consciousness. I don't know, it, it is one of those things that keep reminding me of uh, the concept of original sin, I mean, which is so hateful and corny, the idea of, of original sin. You know, and you really struggle to lose that concept as soon as you lose organized religion. But there's something and some quality in life, some, some kind of weakness or craving uh, that you don't, one doesn't seem to be able to, 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 to get away from. I mean, addicts have often talked about their substance as something that almost has a life of its own, as a tempter. And, uh, uh, it's a substitution for everything else. I think drug is the drug is whatever you want it to be. It's 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 something that will take you away from from your present space and and bring you pleasure that's somehow free that you don't have to pay for, which of course is illusionary because there isn't any there isn't anything that you don't have to pay for. One of the strangest things about life, I think, is how absolutely nothing is free. The old, uh, the old saw about there being no free lunch, it's, it's uncanny. It's, it's weird how true that is, that everything has to be paid off on one end or the other. And so drugs are like, like anything else. You, 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 you just don't get away with anything. I think it has been... Uh, represented uh, you know pre in, in variously and uh, and well by I mean by by writers like uh, well for example like Burroughs uh, and you know and even writers who don't directly write about uh, addiction in a way discover uh, the, the, the the principles the, the, the truths that addiction leads you to I mean Addiction is full of, you know, as, as Burroughs knew, it's, it's, it's full of dreadful pain. It's also full of comedy. I mean, every addict's story is, of course, tragic, and a, a tale of destruction, but it but it's also, also has its constantly ludicrous side. So that, you know, it's, it, uh, it really is, you know, hum the human being as, as, as fool. Uh, and you know, you know, one knows that it's, you know, that it's a mugs game that you can't get ahead of it, that it's never quite going to pay off. But I don't know. You always sympathize somehow. At least I always sympathize with some somebody after their high. You know, it's 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 a distressing thing to see somebody. You know, get to 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 worship their own asshole in this awful way that all they're doing is is trying to generate satisfaction, and yet, in a way, you you kind of have to sympathize with the drive for for ecstasy. With uh, you know, when I was really young, when I was really young and dumb, uh, I really I thought you know thought thinking of the great musicians. Uh, you know, I thought, oh, well, the junkies are holy. I mean, I don't think that anymore. But when I thought of the great jazz musicians who had succumbed, I thought there was a kind of holiness about this. That the glamour of it, I think, entraps a lot, a lot of people. And I, you know, it might have entrapped me. I think if I hadn't been lucky. Oh, just to get in and out of that world, you know, more or less. To the extent that I think I've 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 escaped the world of addiction, uh, uh, I didn't, you know, I I, I I I haven't at least at this point I have not been trapped by the world of addiction. I've I'm still alive. Uh, I still I can, I can still count to ten. 
uh, I can still put one word in front of another, and I think, you know, to that extent, I've been lucky because some people have been de destroyed, either by the work. I mean, in, in the case of a writer, writing is, writing is lonely. It's one of, uh, Hemingway said about, about writing that uh, it's, an end, it's, it's, an end of, it's a way of ending the day. And I mean, that's so true because you're by yourself, you get absolutely jacked up, you get in an intense emotional state, then the next thing to do is, is kind of come down and go to sleep and, and work it off somewhere. But you're in, most of the time you're, you're in a room by yourself. You know, you, writers spend more time in, a room, in rooms, staying awake in quiet rooms than they do hunting lions right in, in Africa. So it, it's, a, it's a bad life for a, you know, for a, for, for, for a person because it's so lonely and because it consists of, uh, of, of such highs and lows and uh, not, not always, there's not always anywhere to take these emotional states. I was writing in a, in, a, in a college library once in the middle of the night and I was working on, on dog soldiers. Worked myself up into a state. I'd rewritten this thing about eight times and I was crying. And uh, I went outside my little room into the dark library shelves and I'm weeping and carrying on and talking to myself and I run into the security guard out in the stacks. He's encountered this maniac which is me, sort of talking to myself out there. And I just thought, what is the spectacle of this, you know, distraught character, this loony wandering through the, through the shelves uh, talking to himself? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard life to sustain, or it's, it's a life that's tough to sustain without, you know, without falling prey to some kind of you know, some kind of beguiling diversion that's not good for you. Well, they're all, they're all not yourself, but in a way, um, they, they, they are not you, but you inhabit them. It's like acting in a way, or maybe it's like puppetry. It's, it's doing a voice. In fiction, a character, after all, is only a voice, is only a voice on a page whose sensibility is put in language. And that's a, that's a little artificial because our sensibility doesn't only express itself in language. We have a lot going on inside us that isn't language in addition to all the language that's going on. But when you create a character in a book, he or she is his or her language. And that language has to stand for a lot more than what he or she says. It has to stand for their sensibility entirely. So you're creating a voice. Uh, when you start creating that voice, you are, you're, you're doing a kind of puppet show. You're doing, a, you're doing the voices as as Dickens once said, has one of his characters say about another character. Uh, in, I think it's in David Copperfield, he, or in Oliver Twist. There's one of the kids in, the ba in that band of robber kids in Oliver Twist who reads the police reports. He can read, and he reads the police reports uh, for, for his gang because he can read. And they, they, they love to listen to him do this. And one of them says to another, he do the police in different voices. So he's, he acts out, he acts out the comps. He, he acts out the defendants and so forth. And this is kind of what you're doing. This is kind of the fun of, of writing something. You're doing the voices. And the voices you hope will become, you know, more than just voices characters. Uh, no, I don't think they can because, because as soon as you change something from, from life to language, you're making, you're changing it. You're changing it in this, 
in, in, in a locktable way, uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't the same, you know, it's, it's something different. And when you put it into language, uh, even if memory didn't distort, which, which memory does, you're still changing it. You can't help it. I mean, with all the commitment to documentary realism in the, in, and truth in, in the world, you still can't help. Uh, you, you, because you're creating your own voice on the page. I mean, it's, it's not fiction, but it's still a creation. The voice, you know, you write a memoir, I write a memoir. Your voice is a creation on, on the page. My voice is a creation on the page. And it's as true as I can make it. And it represents me as, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, as truly as I can represent myself. But it's still a structure, you know, something I've, I, I've invented to, to, to be me. I've, I've written this, this, this style, I've written this sensibility, this way of thinking, and I'm saying, okay, for, the, for our purposes here in the memoir, this is me. This voice you're hearing is me. And that's always, there's always artifice there. Oh, well, I was always in awe of the form. I, I, uh, I did uh, my first novel before I did my first sh uh, short story. I, um, I earnestly pray, and I hope that it isn't novel fatigue, because I have actually, I, 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 miss, uh, I miss the novel. I'm working on one now, which I hope will, you know, which uh, will give me the satisfactions that, uh, you know, I have always got from, uh, from the novel. Now, it's, it can be, it, you know, it can be harder to write a good story than to, to, to write a novel. In a way, you get the impulse to, to, to shorten, to compress. If you don't watch it, you know, you can suppress everything. You can, uh, but you do, get a, you do get an impulse to make it simple, make it, make it short. Uh, but I, I, I'm, 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 I am interested in, in stories. My stories are different from my novels in that I think I, I don't forgive people as readily in my characters. I don't forgive my characters in, in short stories to the, to the extent that I do in a novel. I think I'm pretty hard on them, actually. And if I have a criticism of, uh, you know, of some of the some of the stories it's it's you know that they're that they're a little meaner than i i'm a little meaner to those some of those characters than i ought you know, than i ought to be uh but i find it i do find it fascinating to write to write stories to to make to make them short to deal with subjects uh briefly well, one thing I did, just in in a, in a kind of incidental uh, way, I, I had never used a, 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 the first person in fiction before, and I did that. Uh, I have a story in there that's in the first person, something I'd never done before, and uh, so I, I, I did that. I tried it from you know to to consider a fiction from that aspect. Uh, uh, I wrote more. I, I wrote a couple things more about art. I mean, the the, the visual arts that I had. I, I think previously, uh, at least one or two of the stories are very much about, you know, about the visual arts and and what they what they are made to carry, uh, for, for, you know, for the writer's purposes in the story. Uh, in, you know, in style. Nothing, I don't think, you know, by, in, in my terms, very experimental, but I did a few things that I'd never done before. I just didn't find it congenial. I, I, I couldn't get the right relationship with the, with, the, with the narrative. I mean, I just found that conventional past, you know, he went, you know, it was Tuesday and he went, uh, etc., just the distance, the right distance between me and my narrative and the I, it was Tuesday and I went, uh, it just wasn't, the space wasn't right. The, 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 the distance 
the amount of space between myself and the point of view just didn't feel right. And that's, you know, that's what you go on. That's what I go on. It doesn't make it any easier, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, I don't, I think maybe for some people it mellows it, but I think one has to be very careful about mellowing. Mellowing is a suspect process. You know, I don't think, I don't think, you know, a writer ought to mellow too much. I think, uh, I think you have to be, you know, hard on, on yourself and, and, you know, not indulge, you know, your own, you know, your own uh, lovable peculiarities. I think you, you know, uh, or, or you'll, or you'll take, you know, you'll, you'll fall, you'll violate your best stuff. I mean, sentimentality is the, is, is, is the enemy, which is not to say that sentiment is. I mean, sentiment is the real stuff. It's sentimentality that's the enemy of, of sentiment. But I think you, I think you have to, it, it, I think it's easier to get too bitter than it is to get too sentimental, actually. I think it happens, you know, it's just as bad, I think, to be, you know, to be cheaply bitter. I mean, sort of, you know, cynicism is easy, and 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 it's cheap. Uh, so to be sentimental is is inexcusable. But to be, you know, totally and and uh, automatically perverse and cynical is as bad as being sentimental. I think. I don't feel I ever had a choice. The only thing that I could ever do that signified for me was 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 write stories, uh, invent people, invent situations, uh, because that was the way I made sense of the world. I I I, I did it, and I do it because. I, I have to do it in order to see where I'm standing, in order to, to find out, you know, where I am at at any given time. And also because I think there's a service involved in working well as an artist. I think, I think this is, you know, the, you know, I hope it's not too much of a claim, but I don't think it is too much of a claim. I think you serve by working. I think any artist who works conscientiously and does it as well as they can is furthering consciousness to some small degree and that's service. So I, so it's, it's, I do it because I need to do it and also because I believe that it's, that it's, that it's service and you need to do something beyond serve yourself. I think the I think that th that if these are people capable of a literary experience, unless they're unless they they've got themselves in some shape where they're they they just can't do it, they, they can't have a literary experience because they've they've cut themselves off or they made themselves too dumb or or whatever, and this this tragically can happen. I think. Uh, there's one that you know. There's a there's a literary experience out there of some kind for every intelligent, thoughtful person. Uh, there is there is something that will will catch hold of them, and you know I think if you I think you have, you know, so you have to know the person, and you know maybe you can guess uh, you know what what they would like, but I think that there is something sort of for everybody out there. Uh, I mean, literature is it's, it's necessary. You need stories. I mean, you absolutely need them. You can't locate yourself. People need stories, and they need the beauty of language. Or language can uglify. I mean, it, a language that, that kind of is, is, is always debased, uh, is always being debased, whether it's on a street or by media, you know, uh, demagogues. The language gets uglier, it gets debased, it, it loses its meaning, 
everything that's that I mean, everything that's good about language that's useful about language gets 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 cheapened it becomes it becomes a weapon of deceit uh, you know for uh, the rush limbos of the world and it just becomes some kind of dross it's hard to go back in time to you know, you, you, to, to, to really assess the Beats legacy, you have to consider the way the world was in, you know, 1955 or so. Uh, and not that the world was so dreadful in 55. I mean, it's just that you have, to, you have to somehow not know a lot of things that you know. And what was it like to come on on the road I mean, my relationship with that book is, is, I think, kind of interesting because it really sort of woke you up in certain ways. And for me, I don't think it's a good book. I never was an admirer of Kerouac as a, as a writer. Uh, I really found him just nauseatingly sentimental and indulgent and uh, half-assed, crude, uh, not bothering to finish his sentences, but above all sentimental. And yet, he could do a portrait of, of, of a, a guy like Neil Cassidy, who I, I knew, I knew Neil Cassidy. Well, he wasn't a friend of mine, but I knew him pretty well. And it was like defining a new kind of animal in a way uh, to come on to come come on the old vintage forty hipster character of uh, like 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 uh, Neil. I mean Neil in life the closest thing I ever saw in art to to uh, to uh, Neil Cassidy and his friends were the, the the characters the bikers in the wild one. I mean, that was as close as I ever saw, you know, a representation get to what, you know, to the style of those guys. Uh, so it was, it was really quite, you know, in the way that the, 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 the books that introduced the first 1920s characters or, you know, uh, 20s gangsters, or whoever, they, they're very impressive because they present a new sort of person to, to the reader. Uh, and and the world was different in ways that that can't be really can't be very explained terribly accurately now. The sense of the American road, the sense of American possibility, possibility, because possibility is 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 God in 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 America. Possibility is is the divinity that we're all that we all serve if we. You know, if you can get away from mon money for for a, for a, for a, for a, a, a few uh, uh, mystical moments. Our God is possibility, and so Kerouac and the Beats. That was one thing they were presenting to, you know, to a, to an audience of of youth was was possibility, which is which is great. I mean, Americans expect a lot out of life and can be can be put down for that reason. But at the same time, maybe it's what makes the place work to the degree that it does.